Good morning again. Ooh, boy. I'm going to take a nap with y'all. Some of y'all napping. Good morning, church. All right, woke up. Let's wake up. Good deal. Uh, it's good to see you and good to have you with us again. Uh, we are thankful for your presence. Uh, there are a few of us that are here this morning uh, that will be adventuring, adventuring down to uh, youth camp this afternoon. So keep us in your thoughts this week. Uh, Caitlin Wilkerson, I see Trelise here. Are you going to camp this week, Trelise? All right, Trelise is here and me and my kiddos. And so we uh, keep us in your thoughts this week and uh, we hope to have a, a good week. Uh, thankful that the rain uh, kind of came a little earlier, hopefully, and not going to have the whole week rained out. And we're thankful for that. We're continuing our, store, our series in the book of Ephesians. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn. We're going to uh, be in Ephesians chapter, continue in Ephesians chapter 4 today. Uh, I've told you recently, I, I like to share some with you about some of my hobbies, things that I enjoy. Uh, I am a on the uh, Myers-Briggs testing. I'm, uh, I, I just jokingly say, if you want to know my Myers-Briggs, I, I know what it is, but if you really want to know what it is, it's called ADHD. Uh, that's what I have. That's my personality, which means that I like to jump from hobby to hobby. Uh, and so I enjoy a good hobby, but uh, for, I've, I've had a lot of different hobbies and probably will have more hobbies in my life than I already have. Uh, recently, though, uh, I started doing some hydroponic gardening about a, maybe a year ago. I don't know if I've even mentioned that here or not, uh, but I have a, a system that uh, in my house and it's it's really cool. It has a, it actually has an app with it. And so I can monitor and even see live video of my plants as they're growing and it keeps me updated on uh you know and it, it's actually really smart in some of the technology it uh there's people that actually you pay a subscription fee and they actually lay eyes on it when they see a problem with one of your plants they'll message you my my wife says it's not fair that it's gardening it's like cheating in gardening uh, it kind of is uh but it has been a lot of fun uh because i like salads and like 14-year-old me would be really disappointed in me right now for saying that. Uh, but I've come to really enjoy a good salad. How many of you enjoy a good salad? You can raise your hand on that. How many of you hate salad? Hey, they're all, most of you are under the age of 15. So there's hope. You'll probably uh, one day like a good salad. Uh, and I, you know, it's one of those things that you don't, you don't as a kid. Uh, and I love a good salad as long as you don't put cucumbers on it. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm on war against cucumbers. Um, I, I always say, and I've told you this, I've shared my, my distaste for cucumbers that the one way to ruin a salad is to put cucumbers on it and you don't even have to leave them on there. I've went to a restaurant and ordered no cucumbers and they, I, I get my salad and I'm like, this doesn't have cucumbers on there, but the chef put cucumbers on here and they took it off because it ruins the whole salad. But anyway, um, so I also like to take pictures of my salads. This is Taco Mama salads. Uh, I like to take pictures of my Taco Mama salads. These are a few. Uh, they're really good. If you want the best, one, of the, probably the best salad in Birmingham, you can go to Taco Mama. You can build your own salad. And I won't even try to tell you what all is in all these. Let's just say that it's a whole bunch of good stuff. And my key to cooking is if you put a whole bunch of good stuff together what tends to happen is good things okay and that's what happens with these salads uh, these are some of my salads that I make at home from time to time some of those are actually a little bit older some of them uh, a little newer I got chicken Caesar over there and uh, we're big spinach fans and arugula fans at our house and love a good salad uh, here's my hydroponic system where I grow inside these are some of my tomatoes over here growing uh, Right now, I've got it where I'm basically growing just tomatoes. Um, last minute, we are switched up on slides. Go to the next one. We'll come back to that one. Okay. Um, and this is actually uh, the app on the far right here. Your far far right. It's uh, actually the app where it, it takes live pictures of it and uh, sends it to the system. And this is actually the tower. And it will it, uh, amazing amount, the amount of lettuce that you can grow on a small uh, two foot by one foot tower. Uh, it'll hold about 30 different plants uh, and it will produce enough salad where your whole family can eat salad every single meal and you won't go hungry. It will produce a lot. Uh, go ahead and go to that next one. Um, 
This is actually uh, some kale that I was growing, and you can see how big. This is my stove. It's a regular size stove, and you can see how big some of these plants can actually get as they grow. And this is kale, and it was getting totally out of control, so I harvested it. Uh, but I, I love kale. You can kale me crazy. That's what in the restaurant in Homewood is. I say all that just to kind of talk a little bit about salads, because the church is meant to be kind of a, a salad. Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes in our mind, we think that church is supposed to be a bunch of people who all look the same and act the same and do the same. They all get together and by the time we walk out the door, suddenly we'll all look the same, do the same and act the same. But the reality is, is that the way church is designed to function is where you bring a whole bunch of people together with different flavors and different experiences and different worldviews. And you mesh them together and blend them together. And instead of looking like applesauce, the church should look like a good, healthy salad. This is what uh, Scott McKnight said about that. Uh, he says, so if we want to get the church right, we have to learn to see it as a salad in a bowl. Made the right way, of course. For a good salad is a fellowship of different tastes, all mixed together with the olive oil accentuating the taste of each. The earliest Christian churches were made up of folks from all over the social map, but they formed a fellowship of different tastes, a mixed salad of the best kind. A recent study by, the, by a British scholar has concluded that if the Apostle Paul's house churches were composed of about 30 people, this would have been their approximate makeup. There would have been, have been a craft worker in whose home they meet, along with his wife, children, and a couple of male slaves, a female domestic slave, and a dependent relative. Some tenants with families and slaves and dependents, also living in the same home in rented rooms. Some family members of a household, uh, some family members of a householder who himself does not participate in the house church. Uh, a couple of slaves whose owners do not attend. Some freed slaves who do not participate in the church. A couple of homeless people. A few migrant workers renting small rooms in the home. Add to this mix some Jewish folks and a, perhaps an enslaved prostitute. And we see how many different tastes were in a typical house church in Rome. Men, women, citizens, freed slaves and slaves who had no legal rights. Jews, Gentiles. People from all moral walks of life, and perhaps most notably, people from elite classes all the way down the social scale, perhaps to even homeless people. You see, the church is in its nature designed to be a fellowship of difference. A fellowship where we can have a common theme, and he actually likens it into that analogy, that, that we're all touched by the salad dressing, right? There, there's something that unites the flavor of us all. But at the same time, when you uh, eat a piece of kale with ranch dressing, it tastes different than a tomato with ranch dressing, doesn't it? And, and the church is very similar in its design. Paul is about to set out, last week we noticed really about unity and how the church can use biblical standards to find unity. And if we're ever going to find unity... Uh, it takes the killing of all of our standards, and we've got to be bound by a standard that is scriptural. Because if we all make up our own rules, well, we'll end up with all different rules. So when we think about the church being unified, sometimes we think of unity, and we think our immediate thought is people who look alike, talk alike, act alike, and have all the same interests. But the reality is, is that the church is never designed to function in that way. We were designed to function in a way in which our diversity is our selling point. Our diversity is something that we can go out and be proud of when we leave out of these doors. It's something we've talked about at length that this church does and, and has done well through the years. Um, and, and, I, and I've kind of loathed this that while we have it, we also need to be celebrating that. We need to be telling others. It's the thing that we can leave this building 
and say, what's different about your church? My church doesn't look like most of the other churches around because I come together and the people that I sit around each week, they all look different. Well, I would venture to say that that is wonderful here and we need to celebrate it and it's the way church was meant to be. I wish every church had this. The reason we don't in many instances, is because sin. Sometimes it's a history of sin. Sometimes it's past sins. But but it was things that we there was a, a conscious effort among many churches that said we choose not to ha- be a fellowship of difference. Only people who look like this are allowed here. And what happens is, while some many of those churches today it would be open to difference, but the, they've just carried on the tradition, and there's never been this this push to diversify but I would venture to say that what Paul is about to lead us into understanding here in this last part of the book of Ephesians chapter 4 is that his desire was that the churches would be filled with people who looked different from each other remember when we're in the book of Ephesians we're talking about a group of people that were primarily Gentiles probably with a few Jews mixed in this would have marked the churches that, sur- that were in Ephesus and surrounded Ephesus. Those uh, little independent house churches uh, would have functioned individually, but they would have been known as the church in Ephesus. And we've speculated that the book of Ephesians is probably not merely written to the church at Ephesus, but all the surrounding churches, and it was meant to be a circular letter. So let's just keep going in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 7. Um, we won't finish, I say the end of chapter 4, we won't finish chapter 4 this week, we'll finish it next week, but begin in chapter 4, uh, verse 7. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Every church member has grace. Now, there's a couple ways we can think about grace. We can think about grace primarily and first and foremost, and I think it's the way that that the Bible probably most often uses grace is is a salvific uh, is related to salvation, right? Uh, that we were people who don't get what we deserve, we deserve death, but we get grace. We get a God who saves us despite ourselves. But also in our individual lives, our individual characters, God has given you things individually in the here and the now. That you don't deserve. You have talents and skills that you didn't necessarily, uh, you may have cultivated them some way, but God gave you those talents and those skills. They're God-given gifts. When Paul's talking about grace here, it's better to think about it in that second type of form. That we're talking about the fact that God gave different people different skills and different gifts. Some of you have gifts that I will never have. Some of you have gifts that I don't even understand, okay? Uh, Because it's so foreign to me. Well, God made us all different. And he gave us all a grace, and it's helpful for us to think about it as grace. That God is giving us something that we didn't deserve. Why do we think of it as grace? Sometimes we call it gifts. Why, and sometimes Paul in his writings, in the similar writings, is going to call it gifts. Why do we think of it? I think it's great to think of a grace. Because what happens when we think of it as a grace is if I realize that talents I have are because of God, it makes me glorify God with my gifts and not glorify Daniel with my gifts. Because I realize that God didn't have to give me that gift and skill, but he gave it to me anyway. So each of us has grace been given as Christ apportioned it. And then he's about to quote Psalm chapter 68, 18. And this is, he's using uh, an Old, uh, Old Testament reference here. He says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives. There was something, there was something big in the cosmos that happened when Jesus ascends on high. And he gave gifts to his people. He left behind gifts. This is why uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit was such a big deal. When Jesus is going to ascend, he promises, I'm going to give to you a a helper and I'm going to instill skills in you. And you're going to be able to have those. 
And he said he gave gifts to his people. These are not just gifts that are natural gifts, but these are gifts that are given to godly people. It's only when we come into connection with God that these gifts ultimately are revealed, the kinds of gifts we're talking about today. And he says, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? If, if, he, if somebody goes up, they must have been down. Jesus came and he lived among us. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. This is God above all, in all, and through all. God works in it all. And he's explaining that by using this text in Psalm 68. So Christ himself, he gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. These different unique skills, we could spend time here, and we're not really going to spend a lot of time on it. It just didn't want it to be the focus of what we talked about today necessarily. But it's really not even these titles that we are meant to be focused on here. Paul, Paul's just basically using these as examples to us. Whatever it may be that your skill and unique calling is within the church um, is really irrelevant. It's just about making sure that we understand that we need all sorts. In order that, verse 12, we can equip his people for works of service. The reason that we're all different and God gave us different skills and different unique abilities and God has even supernaturally given us different abilities according to this text is so that the church can be equipped to meet the needs of different people. There are things that some of you see that I don't see. There's times where we miss things that we shouldn't miss and somebody has to come behind us and say, hey, you missed this. And somebody has this gift of discernment and being able to see when somebody in the church is not, something's just not right. They're, they're hurting or they're grieving. He says, listen, the reason we have all these different people and the reason that everybody's not the same is because we need to be able to see and equip people to work and to build up so that the body of Christ may be built up. The only way the body is built up is when different people are using their skills to build it up. This is why it's very rare to find anybody who builds a house all by themselves. You may have one person that does a lot of the work, but my experience is, is that most houses that are built, you have somebody that comes in who specializes in laying foundations. Well, before that, you have somebody that does site work. Then you get somebody that lays foundations. Then you have somebody that specializes in framing. Then you have somebody that specializes in plumbing and electric. Then you have somebody that, that specializes in, in finishing work. And then you have somebody that specializes in decorating. You have somebody that de specializes in painting. You have all these different people in order to build up a house. Because if you really want the house to be made right, you want people who all day, every day do that thing. You know, that's, when you go to a surgeon, what do you want to know? How many times have you done this surgery, Right? And you want somebody who spends all day, every day, doing this surgery. If I need my knee worked on, and I go and I find out that I've got a heart surgeon, that heart surgeon is extremely skilled, but I would much rather have somebody who works on knees every day. Because there's just something about specializing. Well, what Paul's pointing out is, listen, you're a group full of specialists. This is why it's so important that everybody is working in the church and building up the church and filling their roles in the church. Because what happens sometimes is we have people that have to fill roles and it's really just not even their gift. It's not the way God geared them. And here, the one thing I've learned is that if you make people do stuff that they don't enjoy doing or they're not called to do, burnout happens very, very fast. And so this is really important that everybody pulls their lobe so that the church may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. You're all different, and that's leading to unity. It seems counterintuitive, but it's the way God designed it to happen. And so we're building up the church until we reach this unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and we're working towards this process of becoming 
mature. We're, a, we're in a maturing process. We're constantly maturing. I won't ask who the oldest person in the room is. I don't even know, and I'm not going to try to figure it out. But I would just challenge you that if you're the oldest person in the room, or if you're the youngest person in the room that can understand me, to understand that we are, as Christians, constantly maturing. This is why it's so important for us not to get complacent. That we're building up our faith. That we're growing our faith. We're learning new things about ourselves all the time. There's no retirement plan for Christianity. Okay? There's no time in which we say, well, I've done my part. And now it's time for somebody else to, left over, to take over. Now, does that mean that we don't shift interest or shift what we do sometimes as we mature? Absolutely, that happens. But it's really important for all of us to ask the question, what am I doing today that's helping build up the church? That's helping the church grow? And we're maturing in the knowledge of the Son of God, and we're becoming mature. We're attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is just, this, it's about a shaping that happens. God is constantly shaping us. And He's shaping us every single day to look a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more like Jesus. And the more and more we mature, the more and more we should look like Jesus. I've seen some people who have spent their life maturing and investing in their spiritual life. And I see them and I see the closest things on earth I've seen to seeing Jesus. I've seen people who haven't spent that time and energy maturing. And I would just say, no matter where you're at, this is not a, it's not a, a shame of saying, oh, I'm old and I haven't matured in Christ. Now, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, listen, we're all on a maturing process. And the best place to start maturing is starting right where you're at. Okay? I use that analogy pretty regularly. Uh, I used it uh, recently the, about this concept of, of repentance and turning. But it's, it's a good analogy to use some other ways that... That if you're driving and you're trying to get to Georgia and you look up and the sign says, Welcome to Mississippi, what do you know? You can answer, come on, what do you know? You're going the wrong way, absolutely. This is not hard, okay? Uh, and, and what you're going to have to do when you realize that you've been going the wrong way? U-turn. Where are you going to do your U-turn at? In Georgia? No, you got to U-turn in Mississippi. You know, when we realize we're not mature and we're not growing, it's just a matter of turning our attention and shifting and saying, I'm going to start pointing a different and new way, a new direction. This is maturing. It's simply saying, it's, it's that concept I drew, try to drill in those heads of introspection, constantly asking, all right, what is it that I need to be better at? And it's not about... And, and this is not about a, a guilt and shame thing where I'm trying to say, you've got to figure out what you're doing better at or you're going to hell. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just simply trying to say that if we're going to grow into becoming more and more like Jesus, we have to constantly be evaluating ourselves. There's no better critic of you than you. And we all have to be in this road of introspection. And when we realize that, that there's something, I, I'm convinced of this, when most people, when they know better, they'll do better. And we've got to constantly be asking ourselves as Christians, what have I got to work on? What do I need to do to be better so that I can better build up the body, we can better reach unity in the faith, we can have better knowledge of the Son of God, and I can mature into being who Jesus wants me to be. All right, verse 14. Then, when we, when we go on this path and we start to mature, we're no longer going to be infants. We're no longer going to be tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. There's a real sense when people first put their faith in Jesus, they can believe all sorts of things about Jesus. And uh, the part of our job, as, or, or the job of more mature Christians, is to see those times and those instances and, and kind of course correct those people and help, help shift them and move them into the right direction. So there's a, a real danger in new Christians. This is why we lose a lot of new Christians. And sometimes we loathe that, and I loathe it too, and it, it, it makes me sad when we, you know, we get somebody and we teach them about Jesus, they decide to become a Christian, and we never see them again. Well, that's a frustrating thing, but it's also, at the same time, while it's frustrating, it shouldn't be surprising to us. Because 
the reality is, is that young Christians, just like, you know, it's just like young anybody, they're vulnerable. And so we, we need to be watching out for them. But as we mature, we become more settled. And every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming, we're not as susceptible to the danger of simply falling away. Instead, when we speak the truth, and by the way, church, these two words are really, 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 Really? How many more times? You got it? Really? All right. Important. Speaking the truth in love. Now, there's some people that when you speak to the truth to them, even in love, they're not going to like it and they're going to rebel against what you say. But I've found it to be the case that most people... Even if they don't immediately agree with you when you're speaking the truth to them, if you will do it in love, you're going to have a much more successful rate than doing it without love. I don't agree with certain things. I don't agree with certain things about your lifestyle. I don't agree with certain things about the way you're living, choosing to live. There's a right way and a wrong way to express that to somebody. And the right way is that it has to come from love. If you're doing it out of fear, if you're doing it out of anger, if you're doing it because you think they represent something that's going wrong with the world and you just are frustrated about it, your heart is not in the right place to speak truth to them. You need to, we need to be asking this question constantly. I'm going to go speak to this person. They're not living the way they're supposed to be. I know they need Jesus, but I'm going to speak the truth to them. But I, I have to know that it's coming out of a heart of love. Because if we miss that, we're going to miss the main point. And when we do that, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. Notice what happens. He's really went from talking about individuals growing. And he says that when individuals grow, guess what happens? The whole body matures. You want to know how to have a, a more successful church? You want to know how to have a more where we can improve here? Well, I know where the first place, when I decide, all right, we need to do something, we need to be better. I know where the first stop should be. It's in the mirror. And ask, what can I do better? And if I can become better, and if everybody chooses to look in the mirror and say, what can I do better? We will become better. The individual parts become more strong. They become where they're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Then all of a sudden, we're all speaking the truth in love, and we're becoming more mature, and the church matures. We're speaking in respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Jesus the Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, it grows and it builds itself up in love. It builds itself up. The church builds itself up. It, it, the reality is, is we all have this obligation to each other. Look to the person next to you. Look to the person on the other side. Look to the person behind you. Look to the person in front of you. Look around. Do your head twist. There you go. When we did that in college, they used to say, look to your left and look to your right. You may end up marrying one of those people. It was always awkward if you were, for me, it was awkward because it seemed like I was always around a bunch of group of my friends. I was like, I'm not marrying any of you guys. Sorry. Um, well, I want you to look at these people because you have an obligation to these people to build each other up. If the church is going to build itself up, each part has to do its work. Each part has to do its work. Let's read that together. Here we go. We're going to start on one, two, three. All right, we're going to try to get right the first time. One, two, three. Each part does its work. When every part does its work, the church will flourish. Last week we noticed that unity is possible if we use biblical standards. 
that we can have something we unite around. We're not always going to be homogenous. We're not always going to look the exact same, but we're going to be united around key fundamental principles that say these are the markers. You have to believe these things in order to be a Christ follower. And Ephesians 4 pointed out those seven things that we talked about last week. And this week I want us to notice that diversity ultimately fuels growth. While we have unity, it's not uniformity. We noticed that early in the series. But diversity fuels growth growth. This is why it's so important, church. I can't stress this enough. It's so important to surround yourself with people. And I don't mean just in a church building on Sunday morning who think different, have different political backgrounds, have different, they were raised different, they went through different life experiences. It is so important to surround yourself around people who have seen different things than you have seen. Because it may reveal that you don't know everything. Okay? One of the greatest things that we can learn as Christians is to understand that we don't know everything. And if you want to be successful at Christianity, here's a one good simple statement to start with is to start with this one. I might be wrong because if we can't say that we're never going to open ourselves up to the experiences of other people and not only are we not going to open ourselves up to those experiences we're never going to grow when when we think we always are right and i've been accused of that a few times in my life i'm bad about that uh of uh, my wife says my favorite favorite words is no and i'll express my opinion you know i, I have a tendency to want to be right. But the reality is that I always need people around me who are, are different backgrounds, different things, because that's the only way the church will build itself up. We need to see things from different perspectives. This is why I always say that one of the things about um, the way in which we structure our church in having multiple uh, well, we really do this in many ways, but very rarely in church does one in Church of Christ does one person make a decision. It's always you're always running it through systems and filters where other people can see things differently and might can have input into that. That's why our elders are not one but many. We have a plurality of elders is so that they can see things from a different perspective. That's why you need different elders with different life backgrounds and different skills and different things. And the same thing is true as we expand out to the church. We need you. This church needs you. Because you bring a unique perspective. You were raised differently than anybody else in this church. You have been exposed to a different set of circumstances than anybody else in this church. And you are needed here. Because it is that diversity that ultimately will fuel growth. And I, I don't mean just numerical, get more people in the pews. I'm just simply saying we're going to become more mature as we spend time around people who are part of this fellowship of difference. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for this message from Ephesians. Thank you for the diversity present here. Um, may we, as your people... May we uh, dig into that. May we celebrate it. And may that diversity fuel our growth. Help us to not be fearful of people who are different than us. Help us to reach outside of our boxes. So that in the, that area of sometimes being uncomfortable, we may grow. God, thank you for the grace that you have given each one here. May we not hide our talents, but rather may we use our talents to serve the body here and ultimately serve you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for King Jesus and his death on the cross, his, his resurrection from the dead that gives us hope of our resurrection in the future. In Jesus we pray. Amen. The resurrected Jesus. Jesus was rejected because he was different. And the reality is, is that sometimes Jesus, even today, challenges things that we don't, 
You know, this is one of the things that I've learned. If you want to be challenged, go read the Sermon on the Mount. It's going to challenge things about you that you, you think, and it's going to challenge you to think, and it's going to challenge you to ask. And that kind of teaching, if we really think sometimes how hesitant we are to that teaching, because the reality is, is there's some things there that just people don't want to hear. We don't want to hear it, and we haven't even, some of it we just have ignored traditionally because we don't even want to know anything about that because, you know, I don't want to do that. Uh, I, I'm going to get the blessing in a couple of weeks. I actually am speaking on a summer series about fasting, and I've talked to you some about fasting. Is You know, one of the things I've learned is we Americans don't like to hear teaching about fasting. <laughs> and obviously, I don't care, you know, I mean, I, I get it. But Jesus challenges you to be better and to be different and to, to live into your gifts and your talents. But also he challenges you uh, by being a stark contrast to the world. This is why it's so important for us to understand when we come to Jesus, we're counting the cost of following a Savior who is inherently different. He's not like the rulers of this world He's not like the rulers of the kingdoms of this world. He's inherently different. And following him will never be easy because of that. But it will always, always, always be worth it. And so this morning, if you've never made the decision to follow King Jesus, I'm not calling you to an easy life. I'm just simply saying, come live the best kind of life. The life full of, free of fear and full of life. Not only in the here and the now, but in the what is to come. Or maybe you're just a struggling Christian and you need us to wrap your arms around you. It's, it's our duty, it's our responsibility as the people that sit here with you each week to try our best to lift you up. If you have any spiritual need, come while we'll stand and sing together.